All right, let's go to God's Word this morning. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, relatively short passage, and we're going to keep things relatively brief today, and I know you're laughing, thinking that's not true. Uh, it is, and I carry my timer up here. That's why I always have my phone up here, and, uh, and I do occasionally look at it, so um, I might this morning too. So <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, and I realize that uh, 12 cuts off at mid-sentence, uh, but that's where we're heading today. You'll, you'll see why as we go through. So let's hear God's word together this morning. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave, he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We pray for us. Father, I pray that you would help us now. I pray that you would bless the Gideons and the ministry that they're doing. Bless your word as it goes out that you have promised will not return void. And we pray that it would accomplish exactly what you want it to uh, around this world by your spirit's power. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I started fourth grade, uh, our class moved up into a new building. So first through third, you know, you're in the elementary school and then we move on up. Uh, like the Jeffersons to the Upper East Side. Uh, those of y'all that ever saw that show. Uh, anyway, moved to the new building, and we get there, and I, I start hearing about this, this class called Clue, C-L-U-E, Clue. And I uh, didn't really know what the deal was with it. I, I knew the teacher who taught the class. It was kind of a separate classroom outside of the normal uh, rhythm of everything, and I, I knew the teacher. She had taught in one of the other classes for a long time. Uh, Miss Moody was her name. And uh, I couldn't quite figure out what was going on in the class. Um, even then, I, I still couldn't understand what was happening. And some of my friends, each week, a couple of days each week, would get pulled out of our normal class, and they would go to Clue, and then they would return an hour later. Uh, well, eventually I figured out this was a class for kids who displayed exceptional academic talents. Uh, so they would do things. Uh, advanced projects and learn stuff that the gin pop wasn't privy to. Uh, I even got tested for it once, but shocker of shockers, I didn't quite make the cut. Oh, uh, well. Uh, but for all my friends who were in the class, academia, uh, broader academia, had given them a certain designation. They were gifted. It's an interesting label if you think about it. Uh, the academy recognized that there was something within all of these kids, some of whom didn't even have great grades, that had been bestowed upon them apart from anything that they could do or deserve. And so the school had this program in place to help these students maximize what they had been blessed with uh, for their own good and for the good of those around them. Well, today we're going to look at this same theme in the passage that we just read as we continue our walk through Ephesians. Paul tells his friends that the Lord Jesus has gifted his people. If you are a follower of Jesus today, you too are gifted. Gifted for your good and gifted for those around you. So we're going to talk about these gifts that we have received, at least a couple of them, for just a few minutes this morning. So let's look at it like this. Our gifts are grace. So our gifts are grace and our gifts are for one another. Our gifts are grace, and our gifts are for one another. Let's look now at our gifts are grace. Uh, I, I can remember another time back when I was a little boy. I couldn't have been older than five at this point. And I'm sitting on the couch in my grandma's house. Uh, she lived right down the street from us, and it's Christmas night. And I'm from a really, really big family, uh, and I had spent all day long uh, getting gifts from every corner. So from my parents and uh, from my grandma and from a bunch of aunts and uncles and cousins, man, it was great. When well, aunt and uncle arrived uh, later in the evening, and they came bearing gifts as well. So now here I was on the couch with yet one more gift to open. I mean, this was like, you know, a cherry on the ice cream. I thought the day was done, and here I am. It's 9 o'clock at night, and I got this 
big gift and sits down with it. And man, I'm so fired up, cheerfully wrapped, beautiful, excitedly. I tore open the paper to find a six-pack of white tube socks. <laughs> and when I saw them, I did what any little boy would do. I cried and cried. And, uh, yeah, I did thank y'all for that, by the way. It makes me feel better. Um, I, I didn't care. I didn't care that their motive for giving me this gift was because they loved me. They didn't have a lot of money, and this was probably just about the best that they could do. But as I got older, I came to realize just how important motive really was in the whole gift-giving process. Uh, understanding the motive behind a gift, the motive and the basis upon which it's given, makes that thing, no matter how small it is, take on a much deeper significance. It becomes a token of the giver's heart toward me. Let's look at this text and see what Paul says about the nature of the gifts that we've been given and see if we can learn something about what this says about God's heart. Look with me at verse 7 again. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. So right off the jump, Paul's telling his friends that the spiritual gifts that believers receive from the Lord Jesus are functions of, outworkings of His grace, God's grace, His unmerited favor in their lives. Now, on the one hand, that ought to humble us. Right? There's nothing that we could do to earn the gifts we've been given, and therefore there's no room for boasting. Uh, ever since Joaquin was a little boy, we have been a lover of superhero movies. And in almost all of them, their origin story is basically the same. Somehow, some way, they are given an incredible ability, usually by an industrial accident or a bug biting them or some sort of experiment gone wrong. And in those movies, you don't typically see said superhero strutting around about how awesome they are. Occasionally you see that, but it's not the norm. Why not? Because they know they didn't do anything to earn the gift, this talent that they have. It was given to them one way or another. That same thing applies here. Uh, as Paul writes over in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have that you did not receive? Now, that's not just talking about spiritual gifts, but it certainly includes that. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it. Can't imagine how dumb we look a lot of times bragging about things that we have no claim to. They're sheer gifts. On the other hand, and I believe that this is Paul's primary burden in this text, the fact that we have received these gifts by grace ought to encourage us. It ought to encourage us. They are tokens of Christ's love and care for us and for our brothers and sisters in the faith. In love, he says, hey, he, here's yet another way I'm going to show you favor to let you know my heart toward you. See, that's what it means that our gifts are grace. They don't come from us. They come to us from the very heart of Jesus. But these gifts of grace also come to us from a position of power and authority. They are gifts with teeth. They have a purpose. Paul writes in verse 8, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, if you're thinking, what in the world is Paul talking about here? It's okay. Uh, while the details are somewhat complex, his overall point is straightforward. So this quote is from Psalm 68, verse 18. In that uh, Psalm David describes God's absolute triumph, his victory over, over God's enemies, over the forces of evil. And to paint the picture, David employs a, an image from classic military uh, and warfare imagery. So when one kingdom would subdue another kingdom, the winning, the victorious king would process back into the capital city with all the spoil he had gathered from the war behind him along with captives from the enemy army, and especially, if possible, the king of the enemy army. And so he would come into the city, and he would have a train, a host of captives behind him, 
again, with all this spoil, and of course, as he's coming into the city, his own citizens in gratitude and relief, they're also heaping more spoil upon him. And then often, he would take some of those gifts and he would distribute those back to the populace, maybe in the form of public works uh, or in the form of things that everyone could enjoy and see together. Uh, in fact, even in the Hebrew of, of Psalm 68, the verb there shows the ambiguity that that word can be translated, believe it or not, both received and brought. In other words, brought to do things with. So the overall picture is that God is victorious over his enemies and that he possesses well-deserved riches. Sometimes in his letters, Paul will take a verse from the Tanakh, that's, that's the, what we would call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and he'll change it slightly. He'll change some of the wording. Now, in those cases, he's not trying to fool anyone. This is not an uncommon process or procedure. Uh, he's not trying to fool anybody. His audience could read the Bible just like he could. And if he had been trying to pull a fast one, it would have been obvious. Instead, he will take a verse from the Old Testament, make a slight change to it, and basically say, hey, this is kind of an analogy. This is, this is showing the same principle that's underlying that verse. There's a broader application. Scripture says X, Y, Z. This situation is similar to that situation, okay? In this passage, he's saying our sovereign God, so back in Psalm 68, defeats his enemies and has gifts. He has riches. Our sovereign Jesus has defeated sin and death and hell, and he has gifts as well, which he now wants to give to his people. Jesus' sovereign power is further highlighted in the fact that verses 9 and 10, look at this. This is Paul's own commentary on Psalm 68. It says, in, and this is a, you see it, it's set off by parentheses in your Bible probably, because again, this is Paul's commentary. In saying, he ascended, what does it mean, but that he has also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, there have been a lot of scholarly opinions over the years on what precisely Paul's referring to in verse 9 there. Uh, for instance, is this descent, ascent, talking about his descent in the incarnation and then his ascent uh, following his resurrection. Uh, that seems likely, uh, though there are one or two other legitimate options. Uh, it may well have been that to Paul's original readers 2,000 years ago, what he was saying was clearer than what we might understand now, and that's fine. That's how, that's how uh, God's Word works at times. Some things were clearer when they were written than they are now. But the overall point is very clear. In verse 10, the same one who came down, who descended, is the one who is the unchallenged victor and ruler. He ascended far above what? Far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. Now, if you've been with us throughout this study, you've seen this kind of language. It's already popped up back in chapter 1. And then Paul uses the same language in Philippians, where Paul is magnifying Jesus' superiority over everything and over everyone, be that a hostile culture, be that Caesar, be that all the spiritual powers in existence, that Jesus rules and reigns over all of them. And so the point is this, the one who is sovereign and good and loving, that one has given us gifts, distributed them freely according to his precise plan. Remember, if you are a follower of Jesus today, you are gifted freely, gloriously, lovingly, and empowered by the Holy Spirit to accomplish their intended ends. But, but what are those gifts for? Okay, we said they're grace, but what are they for? What is their purpose? Thankfully, we don't have to look far to find out, at least in broad strokes, and that's what we're going to look at now for just a few minutes. Our gifts are for one another. Let's look at that now. In her book, Saving My Assassin, Dallas attorney uh, Virginia Prodan tells the incredible true story of her early life and upbringing in Romania. A highly intelligent and motivated girl, Victoria worked her way through elementary school and then to high school and university, eventually earning her Juris Doctorate to become an attorney. Uh, Virginia had always wanted to fight for the oppressed, and she would have the opportunity to do just that 
though in a way she never would have seen coming. Uh, Virginia grew up during the reign of Nicolae Ceausescu, uh, the communist leader of Romania, which was heavily influenced, of course, by the Soviet Union and had long been a client state uh, up, up through the 60s. Uh, in an effort to endear itself to Western nations, the Romanian government made a big deal, a big deal, about religious tolerance, even enshrining freedom of religion in its legal code. The reality on the ground, however, was something quite different, especially for evangelical churches that refused to follow in lockstep with the government. Though Virginia grew up a nominal Christian, she didn't truly come to faith until early in her adult life. At around the same time, she finished her legal studies. This incredibly bright and truly gifted lawyer had this opportunity, an amazing opportunity, to have a high-profile state-sponsored job as an attorney with the promise that not only would she have a massive salary compared to her former Romanians, but she would also have the opportunity to travel around the world and have incredible amounts of freedom with her children and her husband, who was also politically connected. However, her heart tugged in a different direction. Many of her fellow believers, her new brothers and sisters in the faith, were facing severe persecution from this leviathan of government that's seeking to choke them out. So she's left with a simple choice. Use her gifts for herself, or use them for her brothers and sisters in Christ. And she chose the latter, and it threw her life into a cycle of danger and struggle and suffering and, yes, joy that she could never have imagined. Now, I will leave it up to you to read the rest of her story. I'd encourage you to do it. If you listen to Audible, Saving My Assassin, I think it's free right now, a couple of bucks on Kindle. Uh, she's a practicing attorney in Dallas and has a podcast. You can catch up more on her story there. Virginia learned in stark terms what Paul is teaching his friends and us in this text today. Our gifts are for one another. Our gifts are for one another. We'll really unpack the back half of this passage, verses 13 through 16, in three weeks. So next week's Palm Sunday and then Easter we'll be doing something different both of those Sundays. But on the 16th, we're really going to dive into the back half of this passage. But for today, for time's sake, time sake, I want us to get the ball rolling, kind of put some tent stakes in the ground, and again, we'll circle back around and close the loop for you. Look with me at verses 11 and 12. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers, uh, or depending on your translation, it might say shepherds and teachers. That's what the updated ESV says. Pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ. Okay, Let's walk through this quickly. Now, don't miss that first phrase. And he, what does it say? Gave. He gave, okay? Remember, these are gifts of God's grace. These are tokens of Jesus' love for his people, given to us by him through the Holy Spirit's power for our good, all right? You got, if you don't remember that, none of the rest of this is going to make any sense. You got to remember that part. Okay, so what did he give, or better said, who? Uh, Paul begins with the apostles. Now, that word literally means sent ones or emissaries. Uh, that term is used in a, a few different ways, three different ways in the New Testament, but its primary reference is to the small, distinctive group who were eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection, who were tasked with the early and foundational proclamation of the gospel. So they're the ones who are building the church, getting it off the ground. So that includes the original 12 disciples minus Judas, uh, Matthias, who took his place, uh, James, Jesus' brother, Paul, and a couple of others who are named. Uh, not only were they the authoritative instruments of verbally proclaiming the gospel message, but in putting the gospel into writing as well. So all of the New Testament books that we have uh, were either written by apostles or by those who were relationally connected with them. So Mark was connected to Peter Luke is connected to Paul. Their work is absolutely critical to the establishment of the church. Now, we don't know how many apostles besides Paul were alive when he wrote this letter, uh, but it does seem from church history that John was the last 
to die. So while some people may be involved today in what we might call like apostolic, lowercase a, apostolic ministry, in other words, taking the gospel to places it's never been, uh, there are no more apostles anymore, okay? That was, this was a, a one-time group. Next, Paul mentions the prophets. Now, this isn't referring to the Old Testament prophets, but to prophets who functioned in the early church. Paul mentions them uh, nine different times in his writings, only ever mentioning a few by name. Now, we don't know a lot about what they did, though if they were generally like the Old Testament prophets, they would have probably done some foretelling, so some talking about the future, but mostly forthtelling. Forthtelling is, in other words, giving divine commentary on what's happening right now, giving the lay of the land, so to speak, and exhorting people to obedience. Uh, now some Christians believe that this role continues in the church today. However, because Paul routinely places apostles and prophets right next to each other in his writings, um, he even says that they help comprise the church's foundation back in Ephesians 2.20, we've already looked at. I, I believe that they just thought the apostles didn't have successors, so their office was necessary to get the church going, but not afterwards. Then Paul says that Jesus gave us evangelists, i.e., uh, those who are gifted at proclaiming the gospel message verbally. Philip is called an evangelist in the book of Acts. Uh, Paul tells his protege Timothy to do the work of an evangelist as well. They're not responsible for giving new revelation, but they are responsible and really good at getting the word out. So think missionaries. Think Billy Graham. Uh, think People like that, the guy that you know at work who has shared the gospel with half of the office. Yeah. This might be you, in fact. Yeah. You might be an evangelist by gifting. Praise God if that's the case. We need all the evangelists we can get. Now, I, I want to make sure, though, that you understand an important point here. I, I told you earlier that Jesus gave us the gifts for other believers, right? I said that earlier. But evangelism is aimed at those who are not believers. So how can that gift be for our, now I say our, I mean Christians, benefit? Okay, a couple of reasons. First, through their gifting, so through the gifting of evangelists, our family grows and our joy expands. Who knows who's sitting out there today, out in the community, who will hear the message and come to believe. The greatest prayer warrior in this town might not be a Christian yet. Okay? The next Apostle Paul, and again, lowercase a, doing massive gospel work, may be in the Muslim community in the 1040 window of the Middle East right now and just not be saved yet. We don't know. Uh, your child's spouse, who will help point them to the cross in ways you never could, might be a boy or girl who will get a Gideon New Testament this week. See, we, we just don't know. We don't know. Second, when evangelists exercise their gift, it encourages the rest of us to be bolder, more confident in sharing the gospel as well, because we're all tasked with and assigned with sharing the gospel. Just some of us have it, an overt gift in us, others don't. But when I see those people who are evangelists. I told you all the story about Billy Graham, who one of my seminary professors went to uh, college at Wheaton with Billy Graham and how Billy could walk up to any Joe Schmo in a restaurant and be like, hey, I think you need to hear about Jesus. And in five minutes, that person's like weeping and has come to faith. Okay, when we see the Billies of the world, the people who are gifted in evangelism sharing their faith, it makes us more bold to share ours. I mean, like, listen, y'all, courage is contagious. Yeah. And the more that we see people uh, using their gifts, the more it makes us courageous as well. If I see an evangelist sharing their faith, I'm more likely to share mine. Then Paul says, uh, again, depending on your translation, the shepherds and teachers or the pastors and teachers. Uh, in Greek, it actually looks like this is a combined term, a hyphenated term. So, so pastor, teacher, or shepherd, teacher. That's men like me who specialize in leading churches, caring for people pastorally, and teaching Scripture. So Paul names those four roles, and here's what I want you to zero in on. Look at verse 12. Why does Jesus give us these people? To equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. 
That is the polar opposite of how a lot of Christians think. The normal American model is this. Get the pros in here so that the saints can watch them do the work of the ministry. Right? That's the truth. Amen. You give people truth serum and they have to ask about you, what, what do you want you know, old Brian to do? Everything. That's the truth a lot of times. Right? Because that's how we think by nature. But that's not what Paul says. He says the reason Jesus gives these roles, and out of that list, there's only two out of those four that even still exist. The reason Jesus gives those roles uh, to certain Christians to equip, to prepare other Christians for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Beloved, you, you are the plan for how the church is built up. You understand that? Amen. It's not just me. It's not just Jake when he gets up here and leads worship. Okay? All of us. All of us. It's not just your leaders. Jesus gave me gifts to bless and equip you so that you can then use your gifts to bless and equip me and others. That's why we talk about our church being an equipping center. Uh, that's what we're here for. We want to equip one another to do the work of the ministry. This is what Peter means when he writes in 1 Peter 4.10, as each of us has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Now look, Paul has a list of spiritual gifts. If you want to look this up, Paul has a list of spiritual gifts in Romans 12, in 1 Corinthians 12 as well, and a couple of different places in 1 Corinthians 12. Those lists are not meant to be exhaustive. Each of them are different, in fact. God has given us all kinds of gifts and talents that he can use to build up other people in the faith through us. But I'd encourage you to look over those lists and use them as a great starting point. They are the baseline gifts that we know that God has given His people. And start thinking about what gifts God might have given you. What are you good at? What do you enjoy? How and when do other people feel blessed by you? It might take you a while to experiment, to try things, to discuss with others who know you well, for you to understand more of how God's gifted you, more how He's wired you. And then start asking yourself, how can I use my gifts to build up other believers. Y'all, God has gifted us for one another. Amen. As has been said, God didn't give me gifts to serve myself, but to serve others, and he gave gifts to others to serve me. And how could it be any other way? I mean, y'all think about it. We are children of the God who has served us by giving us the greatest gift he could give, his son. We are followers of the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The one who saw our need, our need for redemption, for rescue, for forgiveness. And he came to meet that need through the gift of his life, death, and resurrection on our behalf. And we are gifted so that we can continue to point one another back to that truth, to that good news that we need today and every day. Hope in Him today, and let's see how God might use us. Amen. Let me pray for us. I told you all it would be shorter today than it was. <laughs> Father, we thank you again for our time together this morning. Uh, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for gifting us, uh, gifting us with abilities and gifting us with one another and gifting us with your Son. Jesus. And so, Father, I pray you'd meet us right where we're at today. None of us are where we should be. None of us uh, have used our gifts like we should. None of us believe as strongly as we should. We are all works in progress, but uh, thanks be to you. Uh, you. You take it, and you love us just the same. So help us today, Lord, to trust in you and to hope in the Lord Jesus that uh, he lived, died, and was raised again to save us from our sin. Help us now, Lord, we ask. And we pray these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.